Good morning. My name is Lauren Garrion. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm actually the children's pastor here at Mosaic. And I'm so excited to be with you this morning, particularly in this series where we have been talking about what it means to become an instrument of peace. In this entire series, this has been our prayer. Lord, make me your instrument, an instrument of your peace. So oh, we started with um, Harry, right? Pastor Harry, and he was, he was talking to us about what it looks like to be love in the heat of hatred. And then uh, Pastor Lawrence continued by talking about what does it look like to give pardon in the face of injury? It's not something that's easy. So what about doubt? What do we do when doubt begins to creep in? Because, you know, it's not just doubt. It's not just the questioning, right? Because once that thing, doubt, begins to make its way into our hearts, make its way into our mind, and it begins to, if we allow it, to plant and take root, what we also begin to feel is not just doubt, but we can begin to feel some fear, begin to feel anxiety and worry and uncertainty and indecision. And depending on what it is or who it is we're doubting, we might even begin to feel feelings of, of shame or guilt or worthlessness. So if you were to take the word doubt and you were to take the word Bible, and this is the generation we live in, right? And you Googled it. You know what you'd see? You'd come up with just this small smithering of a verse. Not, e- not even the whole thing, just this itty bitty piece. And what it says is this. It says, you must believe and not doubt. Fantastic. I agree. But how? How do we believe and how do we not doubt? So this morning, we're going to look in the book of Mark. Okay, Mark is one of the books in the New Testament. It's one of the four gospels where Jesus' disciples is telling us about the things that happened as he walked this earth. And we're going to be in chapter 9. Now, this particular event was also recorded in Matthew and in Luke, but Mark is the author who pins just these beautiful amounts of details, and we don't want to miss that. So that's where we're going to settle. Now, before we get to this moment, I want to stop right before it happens. Because right before we get to this uh, main part of our story where we're going to talk about faith, or we're going to talk about doubt, or we're going to talk about all of those things, Jesus and three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, had gone up on a high mountain. And while they were up on this high mountain, these three men witnessed Jesus' appearance transform. Okay, the Bible tells us that his clothes were a dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could make white. Like that's white. We're talking white, something that's absolutely amazing and incredible. Now, we're not gonna go into the transfiguration, what this is known about, right? Uh, Any more than this right here, okay? We wanna hear what God had to say about this moment. And in verse seven, he says this, a cloud appeared and covered them, being the disciples of Jesus, and a voice came from the cloud, this is my son whom I love, listen to him. Who is this Jesus? This Jesus is the son of God. What this moment is pointing to is is not only just who Jesus is, but his power, his might, what he can do, and not only that, but what he will do soon here to come, okay? So we see that God, that Jesus is powerful, that he's God's son, and then this happens. When Jesus and the disciples, they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them, meaning those disciples that had remained behind, and the teachers of the law arguing with them. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and they ran to greet him. What are you arguing about, Jesus asked. And a man in the crowd answered, teacher, teacher. So just imagine for a moment this scene, okay? We've got at least nine of the disciples. There were 12, right? Three of them went up with Jesus. We've got at least nine men here that are arguing with the religious leaders. Now they're arguing, right? And we know it's probably not a friendly kind argument because a crowd is gathering. Crowds gather when something's happening. 
So they come around and they're trying to figure out what is happening right here in this moment. And then all of a sudden Jesus becomes present. Things get even more exciting. The people are coming in even more droves, right? Because they want to see what is about to happen here. And then in the middle of it, stopping all of it is this father saying, teacher, teacher, let me tell you what this all is about. He says, teacher, I brought my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground and he foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and he becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You see, prior to this, Jesus and his disciples had been going from village to village, right? And Jesus had been teaching the people about God and he had been healing and even performing miracles. Well, into this time, there's a moment where Jesus pauses with his disciples and he sends them out. He gives them the power to go out and he sends them out two by two. And he gives them the power to cast out evil spirits. And the Bible tells us that the disciples, when they went out in these pairs, they told everyone they met about God and to repent of their sins and to turn to him. And they also cast out demons and healed many who were sick until now. Look with me. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. And it has often thrown him into the fire, into the water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help. Did you hear what the father said? If you can. See, most surely by this point in time, the father has tried absolutely everything he had and could do to help his son. Can you imagine the number of medications or methods that people may have recommended him to try, right? Just in an effort to make this stop, to make this leave his son's body. And every single time, nothing worked. And so he is desperate and he is crying out. And he says, if you can. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. And immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me, help me overcome my unbelief. He was saying, help me in spite of me. The father knew it, right? His faith was weak. There was this part of him who has watched his son over and over and over again, not be healed, not be helped. And he's wondering, can Jesus really do it? Because nothing else has worked. Please, please please let this work. Jesus, please be the one that I can trust in. Be that very thing. He longed for Jesus to help. He longed to trust him. And I I love this because the father is so honest. He's honest about his doubt, but what he doesn't do is he doesn't linger there. He doesn't stay in the doubt. Instead, he says, help me. Help me overcome it. And that's exactly what he was doing. So verse 25, when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirits. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet and he stood up. You know, I can't help but in this moment, imagine the father. Have you ever thought about that? The father. Can you imagine? I I can just see tears running down his face and him, him going and grabbing his son in his embrace because for the first time, for the first time in years, his son is okay. No, his son is more than okay. His son is safe. His son is safe all because of Jesus. After this, Mark continues with us and he takes us to the disciples. He says that after Jesus had gone indoors, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? 
you know, it, Mark doesn't tell us what the disciples were thinking in that time. He, he doesn't tell us what was going on in their hearts or in their minds. But I can't help but think that perhaps what happened to the disciples is what happens sometimes to us. You see, God gives us this ministry and we're so excited, but we know we can't do it. And so we lean on him for all of his power and all of his direction and all of his might. And day after day, we go and we go and we go. And you know what? He does exactly what he says he's going to do. And he, and, he, and he provides and the ministry grows and things are great and things are going wonderful until the moment that we start to realize when we woke up, we forgot to pray. That when we stood up to teach, it was just because we were teaching because, well, we've done it so well before. And what was once solely relying upon Jesus suddenly became reliant upon what we knew was our own past accomplishments. And so when they came out to do something that only Jesus could do in their own power, they failed. And Jesus replied, this kind can come out only by prayer meaning this can only come out by coming to me through my power. You see, we we don't see anywhere where the disciples had prayed before they cast out the demon, right? But what we do see is we see that father pray. We see his prayer of help me overcome my unbelief. And this beautiful short little prayer, you know what it was characterized by? It was characterized by honesty. Stood before the God of creation and said, I struggle. I struggle believing. Help me. He was helpless, but he was hopeful that Jesus would do something. And he was specific, and he was passionate. Now, the book of Matthew also records this moment between Jesus and the disciples and, and the father and the young man. And, and what Matthew does is he, re, he records it just, he gives us more detail on what Jesus said to his disciples. So we're going to look at that. It says this in, in chapter 17, verse 19. It says, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out, meaning the demon? And he said to him, because of your meager faith, for truly I say to you, If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Now, here's the thing. Some versions, when they translate this, instead of meager, they use the word little. But I want to sit on the word meager for a moment because here's the thing about the word meager. Meager doesn't necessarily talk about quantity, right? About the amount. When we talk about something that's meager, we're also talking about the quality of something. And there's something here Jesus is telling the disciples that's lacking. You see, the father's faith was weak, yes, but he was looking in the right direction. His eyes were transfixed on Jesus, right? Now, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, that means a mustard seed. I don't know if if you know this or you picked it up, but it's one to two millimeters. I didn't know what that looked like, so I Googled it, right? Do you know that a millimeter is the size of a sharpened pencil point? That is tiny absolutely tiny. You see, when Jesus is talking, he's saying the issue is not the size or the depth of one's faith. He's saying the issue is the direction and to where, to whom someone is looking. Because so often you get fixed on circumstance and not on who it is that you're crying out to to fix or to be a part of or to make well that circumstance. And who is that? Jesus. You know, faith is so much less about us, and so much more about the one who we're placing it in. Because he is the God who is powerful, omniscient, omnipresent. He creates things. He put breath in our lungs. He can move mountains. You know, um, 
I had the privilege of going to um, Indonesia one time, it, it, just for a few weeks. And the missionaries who were there, they were translating the Bible because they were working with a tribe who did not have a written language. So they went in there, they spent years of their life learning the language, creating it into a written language, and then they started translating the Bible. And it was such an amazing opportunity. We had to fly into this village, okay? And I remember so clearly standing in the runway and it being translated to us the story of how this runway was built. Because this was a village and this was a people who desperately desired to hear more about Jesus. They had heard about him, but they didn't know They didn't know enough and they wanted to know more. And so they were asking for missionaries to come to their village. And so the planes were coming and they were going around the village and they were driving around, driving, flying around. And they were looking down, looking for a clear landing spot. The people had already cleared out a strip. They were ready for the missionaries to come. But when the plane was going to land, he circled and he circled and he circled because the mountain was in the way. It was in the way and the plane could not have a safe landing. He went back another day and circled and circled and circled and still he couldn't figure out how it was he was supposed to land his plane safely there, right? And so he was gonna try one more time and then that was it. There was no, they were gonna have to find another way into the village besides through the air. And so the men of those villages, two of them, They went up to the top of that mountain and they stayed up all night praying and fasting and begging God to move a mountain. You know what happened the next day when the pilot came? He could land his plane. So often we think, God, is that really true? It is. Because it's our God who's the one that's making it happen. You see, when our eyes are transfixed on him, nothing is impossible. And how is it that we keep our eyes transfixed on Jesus? Well, we come to him, right? We draw near to him. How do we draw near to him? Jesus tells us through prayer. And the beautiful thing about prayer is we do it as we seek him, as we call out to him, he draws us near. You see, God is saying, draw near to me and ask me to help you understand why it is this circumstance that you may be in is happening. Ask me to give you a different perspective on, on perhaps why it is things have gone down the way that he did. And you know what? Even if you don't understand in the midst of it, you know what? I will walk alongside you. You see, the all-knowing, omnipresent God walks beside you. You know, the book of James is um, another book in the New Testament that really discusses faith. And James, he's the one that reminds us not to doubt, but instead to believe. And it's not doubting. What he's telling us is to not believe in the moment, to not believe in the circumstance, believing that that is the thing that's going to be changed, but believing in God, the one who has the all power to do whatever it may be that he desires and what he knows is best in that circumstance, in that situation. So what if? What if the father hadn't asked, can you heal my son? What if the father had asked, would you heal my son? And what if, what if Jesus had said no? What do we do then? What do you do then? What do you do when you're on your knees crying out to God for him to do something, for him to say yes? And his answer is no. Be it for him to heal a, a loved one. Be it to help in, in the financial situation you may be in. Or maybe it is you're stuck in this unjust situation. Why will God not pull you out when it's not even your fault that you're there in the first place? Here's two things 
that we need to understand. And that's some misconceptions. Here's misconception number one. You see, God hasn't done blank because you don't have enough faith. You understand what I'm saying? You're, it's not my faith must not be strong enough. And that's why Jesus isn't answering. No, that's not what happened. You see, that line of thinking, that type of idea, that comes from that comes from the way that the Pharisees act and the way that the Pharisees talk, right? They understood it as if you don't do X, Y, and Z, then God is not gonna find favor in you. But that's not our God. That's not who he is. That's not the God of love. That's not the God of mercy. That's not who he claims himself to be in. And that's not who Jesus is. You see, the father believed and the son was healed, right? It's easy to understand how we have that misconception. We can look all throughout the New Testament. There, there's a lady who was bleeding. And so she knew, she just knew if she just reached out and touched Jesus's robe, she would be healed. And Jesus said, because of your faith, you've been healed. Miracle after miracle we can find in the New Testament where that's happening. So it's easy to think that that's gotta be it, Right? He's saying no because our faith must not be enough. Well, let's look at two things. First, we're going to flip back over to Mark chapter 6, okay? Because in this chapter, what we do is we see Jesus arriving in his hometown of Nazareth. And just like he's done in every other village, he goes to the synagogue and he begins teaching. And as he begins teaching, at first the people were in awe, in awe of the things that he's saying. But, but then they begin to realize, who he is, right? They remember this man from growing up and rather than believing in him, they reject him. They reject everything that he has to say. And in fact, they they run him out of the town. And Mark tells us, because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place hands on a few sick. Why? Why the no? It's not because they had little belief. It's because they had no faith at all. You see, God's favor is not accomplished by anything that we can do. God's favor comes only through his grace and his mercy and his love. You know, I I love how a fellow pastor put it. He said, we can never have enough faith that impresses God enough to do something for us. You see, God's favor is accomplished through his grace and his love alone. So those individuals didn't have faith, right? But what about if you do have faith? What if you do have faith and God still says no? The Apostle Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says this, So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. And each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That is why I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and in the hardships and in the persecutions, and in the troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. You see, God's greatest plan for you is to know him. To know him. To intimately know the Father. To to become more like him and then be an instrument, right? Right? be an instrument that reflects him to the world around us. And here's the reality. The reality is is that many times this happens best when he doesn't say yes to something that we're asking for. And it's not because he's unloving. And it's not because you lack faith. It's because God is working something in you and through you that has far greater eternal value than your temporary happiness. And I know that isn't always easy to hear. And I know that doesn't always make sense. 
but know that even when it doesn't make sense, your faith isn't in what's happening. Your faith is in the God who controls the world and the God who loves you so much that he came to die for your sins. You know, our doubts begin to cease when we draw near to Jesus. You see, if our goal in this life, is our, if our goal as Jesus followers is to mature in Christ, right? Meaning to know him more, to, to learn about his wisdom, to, to bring it into our own lives, to be shaped and to be molded, to, to look like him, to transform the world because of who he is in us, then you know what? We can have joy and we can go forward no matter the circumstance because it's not our circumstance that we're trying to fix. It's not our circumstance that our end goal is at, right? Our end goal is becoming like Jesus. It's walking with Jesus. It's shining Jesus. And so when he's our goal, no matter what it is that's surrounding us, we can stand strong in his strength. And our doubt ceases and our faith increases. I want to leave you with this. In Psalm 73, it says, God, I belong to you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, leading me to a glorious destiny. Whom have I in heaven by you, but you? I desire you more than anything on earth and my health may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart and he is mine forever. Those who desert him will perish, for you destroy those who abandon you. But for me, how good, how good is it to be near God? Because I have made the Savior Lord my shelter, and I will shout about the wonderful things that he has done. Father God, you... Your God, there are not enough words in this world to describe your greatness, your goodness, your love, your mercy. There are not enough words in this world to describe how much you care for us. In fact, you know, Jesus, you, you were there. The other night, my, my friend and I were talking about our children and how we're in this, this season of toddlerhood and how goodness, it's hard and they don't listen. And it's like all we ever do is tell them no. And in the hardest of days, we just can't wait to like go to bed. But then when they go to bed, we desperately miss them. And she said this, how wild is love? And then I thought, God, how wild is your love for me? When things don't make sense, God, when we don't understand, when we don't have the answers, one thing that we know is true is who you are. And in that, we never need to doubt. Because day after day, year after year, you will remind us and you will show us that you are God and you are good. So God, we ask you that when we come across those doubts and and we, we suffer in those weaknesses, Father, that you take those and you mold us and you shape us so that when someone else comes along who's struggling, when someone else comes along who's doubting, we can be your voice in their heart, in their mind, reminding them when they desperately need you most that you are there. Thank you, Jesus.